Welcome to the Great IO Get Together. On tonight's show, quips and queries about the world of work as IO psychology comes alive. Now, please welcome our hosts, Richard and Tara. Thank you so much, Barry, and uh, welcome everyone to Great IO Get Together number 13, Lori Foster, Global IO Leader and International Woman of Mystery. My name is Richard. This is my co-host, Tara. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to be in the loop for our next show, make sure you click the subscribe and the notification bell uh, below this video. Uh, join our show's Discord. You can join our email notification list, whatever you like. Uh, you can find details about all of that on our website, thegig.online. All of our regular shows, this one is no exception, have two halves. In the first half, we have a little fun. Second half, we get a little more serious, all with our guests of the day. Our guest for today is Dr. Lori Foster, Professor of Industrial Organizational Psychology at North Carolina State University and the University of Cape Town in South Africa. She has held visiting scholar appointments at London Business School, Singapore Management University, and the universities of Valencia, Barcelona, and Bologna. Lori has been also been a, a fellow with the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences Team, Behavioral Sciences Advisor to the United Nations, and is President-Elect for the International Association for Applied Psychology. Has extensive experience practicing and sharing the good word of IO all over the world. Uh, welcome to the show, Lori. Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Today's game is called, Where in the IO World is Dr. Carmen Sandiego? Uh, if you're watching live with us for the show, uh, please share your own thoughts and comments uh, during the game or after, uh, we're out, which I'll share live on the show with our guests. Uh, you can do this either in the on-air channel in Discord uh, or in the YouTube chat. So after the mid-show break, we'll chat a bit more with Lori about her international work. So with that, I will hand this over to Tara. Okay, Lori, this is your last chance to back out. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> I am ready. Okay, so this game is called Dr. Carmen San Diego. So Dr. Carmen San Diego is an international IO criminal. Um, and you know what? I didn't actually decide what her crime was. I guess it's something really bad like harking. So, so she has been harking um, and she's on the lam and it's your job to catch her. So you and Richard are going to work together to solve the clues to find out where she's hiding. Um, there are no prizes in this game. So for your first clue, you're going to consult with an expert from Spain, and he's famously tricky, unfortunately, and he won't agree to help you until you prove your worth. So here, let's hear what he has to say. Hi, Lori. Pleased to participate in your trivial. And I assume that you probably will guess that my question relates to IAP, the International Association of Applied Psychology. Here it is. Who was the first president? of the Division I of IAP. Peter Renth, Bernard Bass, Miriam Merez, or Bernard Wilbert? Okay, so you need to decide who was the first president of Division I of IAP. Peter Drenth, Bernard Bass, Miriam Erez, or Bernard Wilbert? So what do you two have to say? Richard, any? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> any hunches? I do not have any hunches on this one. Um, man. Let's see. Well, I don't think Jose Maria would have given them in order. So I don't actually know the answer to this, but I'm going to say <laughs> no to A, because he probably wouldn't have given us the first one first, right? Mm. What do you These think are of that? test taking strategies I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think about Bass? Yeah, it almost feel it almost feels too obvious to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and he is talking about Division One, right? So Division One Division organizational one. psychology. What do you think, Wilbert? Okay, well, I trust you that the answer is Wilbert. So. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna pretend that it's correct. Um, and now for the next clue, you're gonna have to stay on the theme of IAP leadership. So, mm. as you know, one half of the duo behind goal setting theory, Gary Latham, has also been a past president of IAP Division One. Um, and Dr. Perot tells you that Carmen San Diego is hiding in the country that Gary has spent most of his career in. So, where would you like to go look for her? Most of his career, that feels like a trick question, right? We know that yep. Gary is Canadian. Hmm. So 
So it's got to be either Canada or the U.S. most of his career. And I guess I should specify not physically located because I'm sure he travels a lot. So we can say <laughs> where his home base has been, if that makes it easier. That, yeah, that would, point, that would point me toward the obvious answer. I think. Canada. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going Canada. Let's see what we find in Canada then. Oh, <laughs> my. oh my goodness. Okay, so you're going to speak with several IO psychologists in Canada to find out whether they've seen Dr. San Diego. You go all over the place and no one will talk to you. But finally, somebody agrees to talk to you if you answer a riddle. So let's see the riddle. Oh, okay. Hello, this upside down question is coming to you from Canada. Which event served to bring industrial organizational psychology to the mainstream? <laughs> Okay, so which major event led to the beginning of IO psychology as a profession? And I'll give you multiple choice. World War One, the space race, or the Big Bang. <laughs> Richard, how far do you want to go back? <laughs> uh mainstream. Uh man, as, or as a profession. As a profession. So I I I I guess I would lean to the war? Yeah. Right? Like as a job. Not the Big so. Bang, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. World War One. Um, yeah, so I mean, what do you think was going mm -hmm. on during World War One that brought in IO psychologists? The testing, right? <clears throat> so Yep, yeah. that's what I'm assuming this upside down clues about. <laughs> yeah. This is amazing. This was... is truly amazing. I <laughs> I admire being able to ask a question standing on your head. Yeah, yeah this kid is not paused. She's just holding that this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> why? Uh, why? Why was that? A, why was that an upside down clue? Do we know? I do not know. <laughs> I mean, maybe it was a red herring to indicate Australia. That's probably what it was. Oh, but... <laughs> yeah. Yes, Linda Zugek, famously upside down. Yeah. All right. And, well, you and, got... and famous. Famously promoting uh, World War One era tests, I guess. That was, yeah. wait, what was that? Army uh, Alpha, Army Alpha Beta. Beta. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And uh, workplace health and flexibility, also valuable. So mm. some combination of those mm. things. <laughs> All right. So Linda was happy with your answer. So she's going to give you your next clue about where Dr. San Diego is hiking. Are you ready? We are ready. She says she was last seen meeting with the members of COSI. Cosi. So where is COSI based? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the hint. The I is not for industrial or anything else. It's actually the name of the location. Oh. So it's not this industrial. Is... It's not international. It's like a... The name of a country? Mm -hmm. No. City? Yeah. I think it must, it's probably a country. That's what I'm thinking. So, how? So, <laughs> what are your options? India, <laughs> Indonesia, Israel. Hmm. I can't read Tara's face. <laughs> I've been working on my poker face. I, I you you you've improved. Yeah, yeah. I, I really thought I was gonna be able to tell just from no, the question. No. no. <laughs> uh, well, uh, so the largest of those is obviously India. Uh, so that <laughs> we'll go right, with a lot of large numbers. <laughs> yep. Okay. Let's see if there's a large community of biopsychologists in India, and. We're going to travel to India and see what we can find out. So let's play the third video and see what we have to see. Um. Hello, my name is Aarti Shamsundar. I am a consultant with YSE Consulting and also the founder and president of COSI, which is a community of organizational scientists in India. And here's a question I have for you, Laurie. In India, which of these actions might get you in trouble with the law? In other words, what of these uh, three are illegal in India? Option A, asking a job applicant if they're married during the hiring interview. Option B, making sure 
that there are spittoons in your factory. Yes, those little things you spit into. Or option three, terminating workers in your large manufacturing unit for various reasons, like maybe the business uh, model has changed or the product has been discontinued. So is it illegal to ask a job applicant about their marital status, ensuring that there are spittoons in your factory or terminating workers in your manufacturing plant for business reasons? Okay, so this is a pretty good example of how the laws that govern the work of biopsychology differ from place to place. So yeah. which of those three things sounds like it would be illegal or would get you into legal trouble? What do you have to say? In India, okay. Um, well, I don't think spittoons are illegal in the U.S. I remember giving an exam one time where somebody brought their spittoon. What? Law- yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was for law enforcement, promotional exams. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was like an NC State student. I was... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe C, you think? I mean, C seems like the least obvious, but which is why I'm gravitating toward it. We suspect that we're being tricky, huh? That's probably (laughs) why. So we think it's okay to ask a job applicant if they're married during a job interview, but it's not okay to terminate workers because the business needs have changed. Final answer? Final answer. You are correct. Mm -hmm. Um, So it turns out that it's still a lot. You could still, for example, write an ad that said, wanted attractive female secretary below age 25, Mm -hmm. and no one would have a problem with that. I mean, no one would have a legal problem with that, I should say. Um, So really interesting contrast uh, as far as as how HR laws are written from place to place. But um, there is a rule that you need to get government permission to, um, to make hiring and firing decisions if you're if your company employs more than 100 people so um pretty different and really would tie your hands if you were trying to do good io psychology in that area that's so interesting i didn't know that me neither um okay well you have successfully answered her clue so finally you are ready for the last clue dr san diego's last known location was in a country whose democracy is 27 years old at the headquarters of an io organization that holds events to hold to honor that history so where would you like to look democracy 27 years old Mm -hmm. sounds like maybe south africa final answer richard sounds right (laughs) all right you found her dr san diego is (laughs) hanging out in beautiful south africa disguised as lori (laughs) there she is in case you're wondering who did that amazing Photoshop, by the way, that was all me. I know. Try not to be jealous. <laughs> well, you successfully completed the game. So you found Dr. San Diego. I think we've all learned an important lesson here about uh, not telling our colleagues where we're hiding when we're on the lam from the law. I'll certainly take that to heart. Um, and let's take a quick break and then we'll do some serious interview stuff. That's good. See you in a few minutes. See you in a few. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, Welcome back. In this second half, we're going to ask some questions of Lori. If you are hanging out on YouTube chat uh, or in Discord, and uh, I know there's a couple of you. I see see both Matt and Emily in there. Uh, Please make sure, uh, please leave questions. Happy to pass them along to our guest uh, and uh, have some interesting conversation. Uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Tara again then. All right, thanks. So to start, Lori, I think it's pretty fair to say that your career has been very unusual. Um, and it's taken you to places that psychologists don't often go. So I'm curious about why you have sought these experiences out. I mean, you decided to spend your time and energy doing these things. What do you see as the benefits of representing IO in these arenas? Got it. Um, so taking me to places where psychologists often don't go. Um, do you mean like geographical places, organizational places, or like topical places? I think all of the above. I mean, I think I think the fact that you're thinking about it in that way is is evidence enough that that you're approaching this differently. But I could mean you know, the UN, White House, um, some of your consulting work all over the place. So um, you know, how do you approach these decisions and 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 jump in and kind of be the ambassador for IO? Got it. Yeah. So 
I think I'll, I'll describe maybe a little bit of just a few of the places and, and try to reflect on that question. So geographically, um, I have had just so many amazing opportunities to be an IO psychologist um, in, in many different parts of the world. So I've traveled to Rwanda, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Pakistan, Myanmar, um, Jordan, Lebanon, and, and the list goes on. And, and, and as you can imagine, each experience has been, has been different. Each one has been unique. Um, and in terms of topics, I've also tried to stretch myself a little bit. And so there I've had chances to work on, I guess, what in other parts of the world would be called TVET, a Technical Vocational Education and Training, um, Skilled Trades. I guess uh, CTE, uh, Career and Technical Education, might be the more American term for it. Worked a bit on apprenticeships, entrepreneurship, qualifications and credentials, um, and even on, on fighting polio in Pakistan, um, frontline workers um, offering and, and trying to promote the vaccine for polio. So topically, I've also tried to think about how IO psychology can be used in these other arenas and then organizationally as well. Um, including the private sector and going beyond the private sector. So Terry, you mentioned my work with the US government. I've worked some with different UN agencies, uh, with the OECD and, and, and others. And each of those organizations culturally, right, has been a different experience. So, so I do feel like there have been a lot of interesting opportunities along the way. And I think probably what motivates me to your question is I just, I'm a very firm believer in how useful our theories and our methods can be. And so I feel like, you know, there is an opportunity to take those theories, to take those methods and to see how they can be applied in these other contexts. I also think that we have a lot to learn about the boundary conditions of our theories. And, and it, it's, it's a chance to, to, to kind of test, test that and, and see, okay, you know, what works, what doesn't, what needs to be adapted um, based on these new and, and slightly different contexts. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's really admirable, of course. What would you say are the major costs? I mean, what are you, um, what are the sort of opportunity costs um, of pursuing these more difficult kinds of research questions and settings? Yeah, I think, I, I, well, first of all, I, I think the benefits um, for me personally and professionally have outweighed the costs. Um, benefits include things like, like, well, I, even personally, I, I talked about the benefits to our profession, you know, expanding our influence, expanding our reach, you know, learning more you know, about our theories. Personally, you know, I've, I've just met so many amazing people um, all over the world, people who have just opened up their, invited me into their lives, you know, into their work lives, into their life lives. And that's been, just incredible. I feel like this has broadened my thinking about IO and about myself and about the world. Um, and that's been, I hope, helpful in terms of just developing better perspective taking skills. But there have been costs for sure. And I would say some of the costs would be like breadth versus depth, right? So, you know, when you're, when you're working in a lot of different things, when you're applying psychology broadly, um, there's not as much opportunity to go deep on one topic. So you sacrifice some depth for breadth, or at least I feel like I have. Um, also just being outside of your comfort zone, you know, um, a lot of times I am the social behavioral scientist in the room. You know, not just the only IO psychologist in the room, not just the only psychologist in the room, but the only social and behavioral psychologist or scientist in the room of, economists, uh, policymakers, development specialists. And that comes with challenges, um, trying to figure out how to, how to communicate um, when people are using different professional languages. And also, it's not like PSYOP. You know, you go to PSYOP and everybody, it, it's, it's like comfortable. You know, you, you know where everyone is coming from. And this is a little bit different. So a little bit less comfortable, a little bit more challenging. Um, and, then, and then there are just the logistics, of course, working across time zones, um, five o'clock meetings, you know, six o'clock meetings, 4 a.m. meetings, and, and just trying to navigate that. 
It's really interesting that that breadth versus depth point that you made, I think is a really important one. And it seems like what you're saying is that you need to keep the big picture in mind, um, which limits the ability to go deep on any particular topic. But, you know, in line with this idea of the big picture, you're currently president elect of IAAP. So can you tell us about your vision? What is your vision for the presidential term? What are you hoping to accomplish? And and maybe just a few words about what IAAP is for, for anyone who happens to not be familiar. Sure. So I'll, I'll start with the second part. Um, IAP, International Association of Applied Psychology, is um, more than 100 years old. So it's been around for a long time. Um, and it is, I think for the listeners who are familiar with APA, maybe I'll start there. So APA you know, kind of covers psychology broadly, and it's got a lot of different divisions, like I think 54 different divisions. Um, IAP doesn't have 54 divisions, but it does cover the breadth of applied psychology. There are 18 divisions. Um, the first division, division one, is organizational psychology, and that is the largest division. But there are others as well. So there's psychological evaluation and assessment, there's psychology and societal development, health psychology, traffic and transportation psychology, applied gerontology, uh, clinical and, and community psychology, and others. So 18 divisions in all. Um, division 15 is students, and it is a very active division, um, which is, is super fun and super exciting to, to be a part of that. Some of you might know IAAP from the conferences or the journals. So IAP hosts a big conference every four years called ICAP, the International Congress of Applied Psychology. Um, this was in Montreal a few years ago. It was in Paris before that. It was in Melbourne before that. Um, so if you've heard of ICAP, that's IAP. And uh, we've got two journals. So there is Applied Psychology and International Review. Um, some of you have heard of, and there's Applied Psychology, Health, and Wellbeing. So it's it's a big organization. It's very global. Um, I'm not the first PSYOPer to be president of IAP. Um, I think I am the fifth. So we had uh, Jose Maria Pero, who you heard from uh, during the clues, which was really fun. Uh, Michael Frieza, Ed Fleischman, and Morris Vitellis um, in the 1950s and 60s. So... Um, there have been other SIOP members over the decades that have also led this organization. So that kind of gives you, a, hopefully, a picture of what IAP is. Now, vision for the presidency, I mean, this is such an exciting time because we have just recently turned 100 years old, and the world is increasingly global. Um, the world in which we live, the world in which our profession exists, and that presents, I think, a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility to actually figure out how to apply our science and our practice in ways that have impact. And that's the big picture. Like my, my big picture vision is to increase IAP's scientific and practical contributions to sustainable development worldwide. And I think, I think we can do that. I, I think we, we have got the person power, we've got the partnerships, you know, we've got the talent uh, to actually make a real tangible difference um, on sustainable development. Uh, when I think of sustainable development, I think of it, you know, in, in terms of the UN's sustainable development goals, it's kind of an easy short way, shorthand way to think about it. Um, within that, I've got more specific goals. Some of them are more internal, um, like making sure that our stu students and early career professionals are supported, uh, growing our membership strategically, um, so not just increasing the numbers, but strategically growing our membership with people who are going to be active um, in pushing this agenda forward and really making sure that all of the, the divisions are supported. Um, when you join IAP, you can join up to four divisions. There are also external goals that I have that kind of fall under that big umbrella. Um, one is partnerships. So partnering with other organizations, partnering with other professions, economists, health, development specialists. Um, I'd also like to see a focus on ethical AI. So I think that, um, I don't think psychology has a strong enough voice in the way that artificial intelligence is unfolding. And I would love to see us apply you know, some of our skills and some of our talent to those kinds of issues. 
So I would say those are are some of the some of the big ones. Fostering collaboration, of course, is another one. Um, just making sure that that we are building those partnerships and both within the organization and also between organizations. Terrific. Well, you sort of anticipated my next question, which is about particular policy issues that you think are most pressing when you mentioned ethical AI. Um, well, let me ask you a different question then instead. So what is something that you think IO psychologists who are based in the U.S. might take for granted that looks different when considering IO in, in other parts of the world? Wow. Yeah, that's such a good question. I think that I can speak from my personal experience. So, um, I, you know, I think the work of, of Michelle Gelfand and, and others can, can really inform some of the more technical aspects of that question. Um, from my personal experience, what are some of the things that I have taken for granted and that I've learned along the way not to? Um, maybe I can take it from that angle. Great. And one is, one is I would say time to think. I mean, I know that a lot of us, um, you know, don't feel like we have enough time to think, but sometimes relative to colleagues that I've met who are working in IO psychology and other parts of the world, we do um, at least more time to think than, than what I've seen. And what I mean by that is I've met, I've met faculty members who, are teaching really, really high course loads, um, who are sometimes subsistence farming on the side, um, who don't get paychecks on a regular basis. Um, sometimes the paycheck shows up, sometimes it doesn't. And in those circumstances, it's really hard to keep up a program of research, to continue your lifelong learning and keep your skills sharp. Somehow they manage, um, but, but one of the things that I feel like I've taken for granted and I've tried not to since meeting some of these colleagues is just that having that time, that space to think. And some of the other the other luxuries, um, like being able to get an article, you know, the, the latest JAP um, when when we want it. And many academics, most academics, I think, have have that luxury in North America and that might not exist everywhere. Others would include. Um, simple issues of like bandwidth, right? There are a number of meetings that I'm on where colleagues don't have the bandwidth to have their cameras on. Um, sometimes the audio is, is pretty sketchy um, and electricity sometimes is, is also going on and off, you know, on, on a unpredictable basis. So some of those simple things that we might not think about on a daily basis are things that colleagues might be struggling with. And then the last one that I'll say, and, and then think about all these things that then wrapped up together, is not working in your native language. I mean, most of the meetings that I'm in are in English, um, despite the fact that sometimes most of the people in the meetings don't speak English as their first language. And so imagine, and I see it every week, a situation you're in a meeting and you've got an important point to make. You're trying to have influence. You can't have your camera on. People can't necessarily hear you all the time because your internet is breaking down and you're not communicating in your first language. It's hard. And somehow these colleagues persist and they do have influence. Um, they've had a lot of influence over me um, and, and over our field as well, but um, the challenges are can be vast. Absolutely. Um, so a lot of students watch this show um, and I imagine they are agreeing with Envy at the kinds of experiences you've had and they might be interested in, in following in your footsteps. Do you have any advice for a student who's interested in the cross of global policy issues in IO psychology? I would say a few things. So one is when I was trained when, and when I was a student, I was taught that I was a psychologist first and an IO psychologist second. So I think one piece of advice that's worked for me anyway is to have a strong foundation in psychology um, to take advantage of, you know, the, those other courses in the department, um, if, if they're offered, to kind of learn more about how other areas of psychology think. That's helped me more than I ever, ever would have expected. You know, I, I, I think I might have even kind of rolled my eyes when I was a student, like, oh, do I really have to take physio? You know, so, but, but all those courses in a lot of ways have rounded up my thinking and, and I can see how they're useful, um, sometimes in unpredictable ways. 
So I think psychologist first, I was psychologist second. Um, second thing I would say is develop really strong foundational IO psychology skills. Um, so to do this kind of work, first and foremost, I think is to become a really good IO psychologist in terms of, you know, understanding our methods, um, our analytics, our theories, at, because that's what we bring to the table. You know, you'll often hear me promote partnerships, um, which I'm a big fan of, with other disciplines, with economists and, and development professionals, but we don't need to become economists. I mean, we've got a really special and unique skill set to bring to the table. So having those skills be sharp going into it, I think is really, really important. Um, so, so if you're a student and you're you know, in an IO psychology program, keep doing what you're doing, because I think that's going to give you the base to go from. Um, third thing I would say is, I would say, kind of develop a global mindset. Um, and that can be done in a lot of different ways. I mean, the obvious way to do that is to travel to a bunch of different countries, you know, and get outside of your comfort zone, but, but not everybody can do that. Developing a global mindset can be done from your own home, in my opinion, um, by, it, it takes work and it takes commitment, but by exposing yourself to different ways of thinking, to different people, um, to different cultures, um, which can be done in a lot of different ways without ever leaving, leaving the borders of the United States. Um, so I would say develop that global mindset. And then lastly, be entrepreneurial um, in your career. That, that's what it's going to take. I don't think that anybody's going to say, okay, I'm hiring for somebody to apply IO psychology to global policy, right? Um, so kind of finding your way, being entrepreneurial um, in your career. And when I think about entrepreneurship, it's often useful for me to think about it the way that Michael Frieza conceptualizes it because he, he teaches entrepreneurs all over the world and I've had a chance to watch him do this. And he breaks it down into three components. He says it's being self-starting, future thinking, and overcoming barriers. And I think all of those apply um, to being a student and, and thinking about forging that path. One is proactive, self-starting, you know, kind of finding opportunities and trying different things out. Future thinking, you know, trying to think two and three steps ahead um, in terms of what comes next. And then overcoming barriers because they're inevitable um, and, and really when they come, um, figuring out how to, how to get around them or get over them or get through them. Perfect. So maybe to wrap up, you could share a funny story from your adventures. I imagine that you've got lots of kind of mishaps and lessons learned the hard way, and it would be, it would be great to hear one of those to, to close our interview today. Sure. So I, I'm, I've had a, many misadventures um, in my various travels and pursuits. Um, I'm not sure I always thought they were that funny at the time, but, but sometimes <laughs> they're a little bit funnier after the fact. Um, one that I can think of was that I, I mentioned before that I've had a chance to travel to several Middle Eastern countries, um, each one very different. And the first time, I think my first trip to the Middle East ever, this would have been around 2016 or 2017. And I was going to Jordan. I was really excited. I was going to be giving a talk to one of the UN agencies and learning a little bit more about some of the work-related programs that they were funding. Uh, they are in Amman and also in some of the more rural areas. And so I was, I was leaving from New York and I left enough time, you know, to get to the airport, I thought. <laughs> and then so I'm out there, um, I go, I'm, I'm, and I'd done, you know, I'd done my prep, right? I had Googled customs and norms in Jordan, like what to wear, what not to wear, especially as a female, um, and all of these things. What I didn't Google is when is the worst time to hail a cab in New York City? Oh, no. Because I didn't need to Google it because I found the worst time to hail a cab in New York City. And it was somewhere between like four o'clock and five o'clock. Nobody would stop. I mean, nobody would stop. And I know that you're thinking that I was probably being polite and maybe I was being polite for like the first 15 minutes, but I stopped being <laughs> polite and I was just like, 
yelling and whistling and, and you know, jumping into traffic and nobody would stop. But I even had uh, Steve, my husband, he was there to wave goodbye and send me off. And he was yelling and whistling and waving and nobody would stop. Finally, some kind soul after a very long period of time, and there was no Uber either, um, finally a cab stopped. And he explained to me on the seemingly eternal trip to the airport that it was shift change. And so even though I was seeing all these cabs on the road, they were going back to wherever it is they do shift change and nobody was wanting to stay late, right? Um, he decided when he asked me first where I was going and he decided that this was somewhere near where he needed to do shift, shift, shift change anyway. So I finally get to the airport and it's before the flight takes off, so it's good. <laughs> so I get there in time to check in, but I didn't get there in time to check my luggage because you have to check your luggage like well before you hop on the plane. And it's like, is there any way you know, there's no, absolutely no way that the luggage can be checked. When's the next flight? Well, the next flight that they could get me on was after my talk was supposed to happen. So I was like, well, what if, you know, if you could just take my suitcase, I don't need my suitcase. I'll go to Jordan without my suitcase. Uh, <laughs> Steve can come and get it. Um, and she's like, I don't know you. I don't know Steve. You know, I'm not allowed to take random people's luggage. You're like, I'm so sorry. But somewhere, some way, somehow, she, she actually finally decided that she would take my luggage uh, with, with the promise that Steve would come and get it later on in the night. So I unzip it, grab like a handful of who knows what, <laughs> like cram it in my purse, run to the plane and make it to the plane in time. So I, you know, when I get on the plane and I realize that I've grabbed a large pile of socks. So now I have, <laughs> I'm on my way to Jordan, I've got the outfit that I decided to wear for the trip and a lot of socks. Um, <laughs> but I made it and it was, it was an amazing trip. Um, I was really, really glad that, that I did, that I made it there. Um, I was working with the UN agency. They were funding small small scale entrepreneurs uh, for different mm -hmm. projects to try to stimulate um, the the productivity, the economic livelihood of these individuals and of the communities that they lived in. And I remember part of this, in addition to giving the talk, was a chance to go out into the rural areas of Jordan and interview and just talk with um, these small business owners who had gotten UN funding to to start something. And they were each so different. And I learned something from each of them. Like, I'll, I'll give you three quick examples. Um, first one that I met, he was growing organic like, cucumbers and, and maybe something. No, it was, it was cucumbers because he'd gotten a small plot of land from his dad. And he decided on cucumbers because cucumbers grow more up and down. And so you can grow more of them as opposed to them sprawling out. He needed to make the most of this small plot of land. And two things I remember about him one was, that's not what he really wanted to be doing. Like he loved, he loved mechanical work and, and that's what he would have loved to be doing, but there were no opportunities for him in that line of work. So farming it was. The other thing was his unique angle was organic and that's what was gonna differentiate him um, as a business owner. But he was struggling with the fact that his neighbors who were also selling their produce weren't doing organic. And the kinds of tension, you know, that, that could, could be created when he's telling customers, this is better, this is better for you, this is organic. And he's embedded in this community. And how do you reconcile that with, you know, the fact that, that your neighbors aren't doing this and it could make them look bad? So I remember that really uh, being eye-opening in a lot of different ways and, and changing the way that I think about, you know, entrepreneurs and small business ownership. Second group that I met was a group of guys who had pooled their funding. So they each got a small amount of seed funding from the UN agency and they decided to go into business together. They were renting out um, like maintenance equipment out of a small shop. And in their case, it was a matter of really figuring out how to work together. Uh, they didn't know each other that well. Now they're all in business together and how do they make all of this work um, just from an interpersonal standpoint. So I thought that was really interesting. And then the last one was this woman who sold solar powered cell phone chargers, curling irons, you name it. And she was amazing. Um, she invited me into her home. 
Um, I can't remember if I had to take my shoes off, but if I did, I promise you I was wearing clean socks because I had so many socks on the trip. Um, so I'm in her home and I'm asking her some of the questions like, um, you know, what were some of your bigger challenges and, and, you know, how do you see yourself as an entrepreneur? What was interesting to me is she didn't see herself as somebody who sells solar powered cell phone chargers or curling irons, which was, by the way, a, a good approach because they lost electricity a lot in the town where she lived and, and this kind of worked. But she saw herself as somebody who's always on the cutting edge, you know, and and um, and, and selling, you know, whatever is the newest thing and just like staying ahead of the curve. Some of her challenges, she said, were um, number one, she said, my husband, and he was standing right there. I was getting kind of nervous. I didn't know how he was going to react to this. But she said at first, he was really resistant. But she said that he ultimately came around. And part of this was he was resistant because as a small business owner, she would need to go into town, sometimes on her own, interact with male vendors. Um, and that was a concern. That was an issue. But, but they got used to it. Uh, she had to learn English. She had to learn more and better English uh, to run this business. And he started to learn English, too. And that, I think, really elevated um, both of them in a lot of ways, just both in terms of their own, just just pride and esteem, and also in terms of her business. It helped her a lot. And so when I walked away from her, I was reminded, you know, once again, how under the right circumstances, work can be so much more than a means to an economic end, which is super important. But it can also be kind of this way to to grow, you know, as a person in her case to even grow in their relationship, which I thought was pretty cool. That's amazing. Well, Lori, I can't help notice that a lot of your stories involve luggage, but I'm going to assume that's not <laughs> something <laughs> this is not a characteristic that you have. But uh, this has been a terrific conversation. Uh, thanks for being a good sport. And can, and can, can, can I ask a follow up a question, though? I guess if. Sure. I, you know, I, I hear all this and I, I, I think about how um, if I were listening to this when I were a young grad student, I would want to know like the one practical thing I could do like right now. Is that is that like join IAP or is that what is that? Like, what would you say if one thing I could do right now to start getting involved in, in kind of global IO issues? What, what would that be? Yeah, yeah, I'll get I'll I'll be super concrete. Um, so, you know. PSYOP's got some great international activities, so get involved in those. And not either or, you know, and join IAAP. Um, the student division is very, very active. Um, they amaze me every day. Um, I, I find out something else that, that they're doing. And we just had this, and, and even COVID didn't stop them. Um, we just had last year, and we're going to repeat it this year, an early career marathon where it was 24 hours of uh, a student in early career. So 24 hours of students in early career around the clock. Um, it was completely virtual. It was very global. And students had an opportunity to submit an abstract. If they got accepted, they would do a recording of their presentation. And then a uh, discussant would come on, you know, and kind of give feedback in real time. So it was kind of a combination of pre-recorded and live um, interaction. I mentioned this because we are doing it again this year. The abstracts are due April 1st or the end of this month. Um, so what is the one concrete thing you can do? You know, get involved in PSYOP international stuff, join IAP, submit an abstract um, to the Early Career Marathon and you'll, you'll meet people and, and you'll get started. Hmm. That's great, thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Well, sounds like we will see you at ICAP. Um, I know I'm, I'm motivated. When is the next convention? It is. It was supposed to be this year. Um, it got pushed to 2023 because of COVID, but it is going to be mid-2023 in Beijing. Awesome. I'll see you there then. See you there. Thanks, this has been a ton of fun. Thanks, guys. I appreciate being here. <laughs> That's it uh, for gig number 13. Uh, if you're watching live, a little weird button, button weirdness just now. That's okay, though. Uh, if you have enjoyed yourself today, be sure to watch out for our next show. I'm going to bring some April excitement related to the upcoming uh, annual conference of, uh, of uh, PSYOP, uh, by Society for Biopsychology. As always, please subscribe, turn on notifications for the channel by clicking uh, below the video, join the Discord, join our uh, email notification list, whatever your flavor of thing you might want. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next time for another great I.O. get-together.
Bye. Oh, the times were hard and the wages low. Leave a Johnny, leave a. I guess it's time for us to go. And it's time for us to leave her. Leave a Johnny, leave a. Oh, leave a Johnny, leave a. For the voyage is done and the winds don't blow. And it's time for us to leave her. That's it for another gig. To stay in touch, subscribe on YouTube, check out our website at thegig.online, join our LinkedIn group, sign up for our email notification list, and join our Discord. So many ways to connect. Thanks for joining us, and see you next time for another great I.O. get-together.